Good evening. My name is William John Cox. In Texas, they call me Billy Jack. Want to invite you to join us this evening for our Friday evening happy hour discussion of politics and philosophy and a uh, bit of a quick background. Uh, back in 1973, as a young lawyer working for the Justice Department in Washington, D.C., I was part of a group we call ourselves a Tuesday Night Supper Club. And we'd get together and at someone's house, and the rule was you'd have to cook a cheap dinner, and we'd sit around talking about politics. Well, I can't invite all y'all over for a pancake supper, but what I can do is ask you to join me and my friend Joanne here this evening, and we're going to talk about politics for a while. Uh, Joanne has her master's degree in international studies from Columbia University with a minor in Soviet Union and communications. She's fluent in, Russian, in the Russian language, and for a number of years, she worked in the newly independent republics of the former Soviet Union to help establish uh, democratic processes. Uh, Joanne's indicated that this evening she'd like to talk about some foreign affairs. So, Joanne, cheers to you. And Cheers. Uh, Cheers. Here we go. Yes. Here we go. Oh. What you up to? <laughs> oh, that tastes good. Well, it's good to be with you again, William. Um, I'm enjoying our chats, um, fireside or not. Um, but <clears throat> maybe maybe as we move into colder weather or get we're getting out of colder weather, we'll have fire chats. Um I you know, it's interesting. I want to, of course, I'm gonna talk about Ukraine, because as you mentioned, my background and I spent some time in Ukraine uh ooh, about a decade ago now um but I think broader I, I think for me it's what I've been thinking mulling over lately as I look at again the year we're in election year and everything is just how how much of an outsized influence our domestic politics have on what happens in the world and it's it's actually um a really big responsibility we actually all have as voters when you think about it through that prism, because the countries I lived in, you know, I, I was in Moldova for three years. I was in Azerbaijan for two. Um, it was interesting being in um, those countries as a person, as some of my staff in Azerbaijan said to me once, she said, you're from a big and powerful country. It gives you a different perspective. And it was so true. And I didn't even realize the perspective it gave me until I went to a week and, and kind of on the global stage, not as important country and talked to people who were from that country, you know, and who felt like, well, the world doesn't really care about our problems. Um, so it was an interesting, different perspective. That's not to say that Azerbaijan was not an important country. It's very important in other ways, but, you know, it's almost like being a voting citizen in the U S it almost carries with it like a bigger responsibility yes. because precisely because of how much like importance and how much power we wield throughout the world. And there's an incredible opportunity in that. Um, there's also the possibility that we can really kind of screw things up for people in other places, you know, and they feel like they're at our whim. And I, I've just been mulling over that this week because I think about Ukraine and I think about the people I know in Ukraine and I think about, you know, what our words mean when we say them as Americans, you know? And so when you look at, um, and there's a lot of things we can say about Russia and I, we can go into that, but really ultimately we've made as a country we've kind of made promises to Ukraine. We've said to them, we're going to support you. We're going to help you. You have our support. And, but at the same time, because our politics domestically has become so divisive, when we say that people think, okay, they think now they think, well, that's to the horizon of your administration. Exactly. You know, we don't, you know, you may feel that way as long as you're in power, but, you know, we look at the other guy and the other administration and things could change. And that was always the case. I'm not saying that that's ra that in itself is radically new. But what's new is how polarized things are. And I hate using that word because everybody overstates that word, but it, it's true. And what that means is that 
Whereas before there may have been a kind of adjustment in foreign policy. Now it's like this radical, it's like whiplash in foreign policy, you know? So you've got a president that says to Ukraine, we're with you, no matter what, we're going to support you. And then you have a Congress that is withholding aid. And it's now, it's really, I mean, did, for did me, you, go ahead. Did you see that one of the Republican leaders listed the Ukraine as being an enemy of the United States? No, I did not see yeah. that. That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Because 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 it's putting us in a position, of, of, of a difficult position. Right. Oh, I see. OK, because it puts us in a difficult position that we. So all this to say, I mean, I could go on for a long time. And I'm not going to do that. I just I just I feel like if we were you know, that that's a whole other when we bring it to the discussion of voting, that's like a whole other um, layer, a whole other dimension is not just about us voting for our, you know, our based on our economic benefit, based on, you know, our own, you know, God forbid, re reproductive rights or everything. It's also about like, you know, what's going to happen in the world um, the based on how we vote and and that sense of responsibility that I, I kind of feel like people in the US maybe don't fully embrace, especially those who just decide not to vote at all. Um, so these are the sorts of thoughts I've had in terms of linking our domestic politics with the broader scope of things and how to like reestablish that sort of sense of responsibility to the world. Because I actually think that at some point we may have had that. Now you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I feel like there was more of a sense of that and now we're becoming more insular and it's becoming more about me, me, me uh, versus us as a broader collective um, and what and what we need to do, you know, for for people abroad and, and for just the world in general. And and what's interesting is this me, 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 insular, more authoritarian, potentially perspective is coming at the same time that we need global co cooperation more than ever to deal with climate change and to deal with some big issues that are absolutely transboundary. Like they're trans, I mean, this is like, requires global cooperation on a scale we haven't had it before. And yet we're coming, becoming at it, we're, we're becoming more fractured. So those are the things that I see happening. Um, and that I think we can start at home by valuing our own vote more um, as a way of fixing it. Oh, not fixing it, but addressing, beginning to address it. So those are my thoughts, William. <laughs> well, you know, I, I, you know, I really appreciate it because I, I'd actually, you know, I've thought about voting. That's been kind of my thing for 40 years, but I've never really thought of it in that particular context that you just, mm -hmm. that you just mentioned. And, and it, and it's, and it's very true because what it is, is that particularly following World War II, I mean, prior to World War II, we did not get involved in the world mm -hmm. very much. We, we were isolationist. Right. We, we were building our country, uh, our industrial strength and so forth, and stealing our, uh, the ideas from other countries, uh, uh, much like China is, is doing today. And, and, but following World War II, uh, with the agreements that the United States led, that, that we were the leaders at the table to establish all of the, the international agreements that essentially established a rule of law internationally. And, and it's that rule of law internationally that allows you to travel to almost virtually any country in, in, in mm. the world, except mm -hmm. perhaps North right. Korea, mm -hmm. and, and, and show up there and your cell phone works and, 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 and you can use your credit card and, 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 and you're, you're somewhat safe in a way. I mean, you're subject to the same street crime or whatever that the, the residents of the country are. But but the these international agreements and the rule of law have have united the people of the world together. And so therefore, we do have this responsibility, as, as, as what you're saying is that and, and we can't just fiddle with it. And, you know, it goes back to you know that you know you sh you should say what you mean and mean what you say, and and that doesn't seem to work anymore. And I can see why there are people around the world who say it's just at, at this point it's which what is the next administration going to do? 
because while Biden can say what he's saying uh, about uh, the Ukraine, and by the way, in terms of Israel, we've got your back as well. He's making these promises, but the the next president may have an entirely different idea. Uh, Trump, it appears, would be quite happy to take us out of NATO. Uh, uh, and that, to give Putin Ukraine too, by, and, by, by and, the way. And, <laughs> and, and I, can saw, I could end that war with Ukraine tomorrow by giving Putin everything he asked for. But let's go back again to, to where we were before World War II. And that is that, that if, in fact, someone had stood up to Hitler when the very first time he moved into the, the, the Ruhr Valley and reoccupied it. The Sudetenland, or, right? Or, yeah. Sudet, or when yeah. he moved to Czechoslovakia and took the Sudetenland. But instead, he was appeased and appeased and appeased. And he just kept getting more and more and more. So, well, we are in a very similar situation today with Putin and Russia. Uh, and so so what, what are our responsibilities? If we had stood up to Japan in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the international uh, 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 court at the time uh, that the League of Nations, I should say, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that Japan was there pleading with the League of Nations or not the Japan, but China was there, or I'm sorry, Korea. When when they sure. when, when when Japan first occupied Korea, uh, we we had made we had made promises to Korea that we would actually it was almost a mutual defense agreement treaty we had with with Korea, and we allowed Japan to occupy Korea, and and so we 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 sat back and in a way let that all happen. And we're we're there now again because the same sort of thing that is going on. We're there. There were authoritarian figures rising in Germany, uh, uh, Hitler and Mussolini in Italy. And even though Tojo in Japan was not necessarily an individual authoritarian, that that was still taking place. So so where we're at today is we're facing those very same issues, and we all have nuclear weapons. And, and 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 we have we have Putin who is absolutely threatening uh, to use nuclear weapons. I mean, it's become even more explicit in the last week or so. He's going to use nuclear weapons against Europe, uh, against the, uh, the uh, against uh, uh, you know he's saying to, you know there is there's a, one of his main advisors who sort of speaks for him is saying you know there's a target on on Paris. Uh, you know, for for what you know, the support that France is giving to the Ukraine, and and so this is really dangerous stuff, because you know this could just yeah. go out of control very quickly. But back to your original point, what are what are our responsibilities? Well, I do think that we have a responsibility more than just you know to to uh, to choosing Biden because we're going to continue Biden's policies that he's expressed instead of Trump because he's going to change those policies. What we have is a responsibility to treat our agreements uh, as, as, as something real. Our, the agreement we made on the environment, the Paris Accords, that, that, that those were real agreements that, that we entered into. And, and pretty soon we're backing away from them. And, and, and because those are the agreements that unite us together and, and 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 it's when we unite together that we're going to find peace. It's when we when we begin to divide up that that we begin to go to war. And and I and I was also thinking just I want to go turn it back to you for a second. But also you know one of the things we need to look at is this whole concept of nations. You know they're all artificial. The United mm -hmm. States is artificial. Uh, mm -hmm. but, I mean even if we break it up into fifty united states that are united. They're even artificial. It's, 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 of Texas it's, is it's an agreement. It's, yeah. an, it's, a, it's an agreement that we all wake up to every day and continue to agree to. Right. In well, the moment. But what every day is, we agree that this is the United States and this is what it looks like. And those are the borders with Mexico and that's Europe. I mean, it's a, it's a collective agreement that right, we all, but, they all but make. It's been, but it's been going on now for hundreds of years, hundreds yeah. of years that we have been establishing these nations. Now, in the, in the past, these nations were more organized in a way around a, a, a king 
or a, a royalty and 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 it was flowing down from that royalty that that which was it, a god-given right who had the god-given right according to right. the bible uh, mm -hmm. god has appointed mind. him it's over you right. yeah. so mm -hmm. so therefore uh, the church would enforce your your following the leader and 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 that's how war started and that's how we ended up here in the united states saying wait a second we're not going to have a king you know that that's going to take us to war or launch wars but we're getting back to that point right now today where we are we are going to go to war and what it is it's a war against the people and it's a war against a nation or a nation and its people you know when i when you when you look back at what we did to to iraq uh at following 911 when when you know, someone said, you know, something is like, you know, why are we going in Iraq? They had nothing to do with it, you know. But it didn't matter. But, Nobody but listened. What, what we did is though that we 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 went in and and we 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 did exactly what the Israelis are doing in Gaza. They went in and they and they destroyed the infrastructure of the country to to break the will of the people to resist. They, 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 we bombed their, their electrical facilities, their water treatment plants, you know, their sewage plants. We, we, we bombed all of this stuff and hundreds of thousands of people died because of this and children. And, and our, our, our ambassador said, well, shit happens, you know, uh, you know, that's, that's the way it goes. Well, uh, that's where we're at today is that are we going to continue to make war against people or other nations and their people, such as, you know, that's, see, that's my concern. That's, that's something that bothers me greatly, uh, is that what can we do about people, you know, to go back, you know, recently, like Saddam Hussein, or, mm -hmm. or this, um, the, the leader of North Korea, or today, Putin, you know, who's, who's an individual who's not only threatening us, but certainly is harming his or her own people. Uh, that's, that's, you know, that's, but I would say the difference, well, see, this is, this is the thing though. It's, it gets to the level of agreement that there is about how bad some of those individual leaders are. So North Korea, I think 98% of the planet agrees that he's a lunatic. Um, you know, Saddam Hussein, he was he was okay for a while. We considered him okay for a while. We gave yeah. him guns and everything, and then he was uh, then he wasn't okay. So I mean, we have the, these figures who are kind of like more minor despots, and then you have somebody like Putin, who actually does still have, I believe, does still have the majority of his country would would vote for him, even though he keeps on running sham elections. Um, I still believe he would win in an actual contest still, maybe not by a lot, but he wouldn't be like 95% or whatever the hell he says he wins by now, but he'd probably still win. So I think there's, there's a difference in that. They're not all the same. And, and, yeah. you know, there are people, and this is where it's like, it's hard to pigeonhole which despot is it that's truly the despot and which ones are we just thinking, you know, are threats to our national national interests. I think Putin is a threat to a lot more than our national interests, but I wouldn't necessarily put him in the same category as, you know, the leader of North Korea either, yeah. especially in terms of how he's perceived globally. So those are that's where you get into like it's not such a broad brush for everyone. No, right? no, no it isn't. You know, but Okay, I, I suppose what I'm talking about is uh, that as a matter of policy, because that's that's always my, mm -hmm. is, you know, as mm -hmm. a matter of policy, uh, how are you going to deal with somebody like this? Now, I think it's, you know, I, I, I originally conceived of this concept uh, a number of years ago. And and I've uh, I've written about it. I've written articles about this and and and, and have sort of applied it, let's say, to Saddam Hussein, who mm -hmm. would be someone you know who we, we could take that as an example and 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 the, the concept that i that i have advocated is that we adopt as a matter of policy that we will never again make war 
against another nation or its people. That instead, what we will do is that we will identify individual leaders or a clique of leaders, if they're you know, more than one, not just one, but but we we will the the administration or the president will mm -hmm. go to Congress and instead of asking for a declaration of war against Germany or Japan or a, a, another country, will ask for a declaration of arrest. That that this goes back to my police background, and and that right. is, that that issues putting an, it on an international stage. Right, yeah. that issues an arrest warrant. And, and and this arrest warrant uh, authorizes the president to use whatever force is necessary to arrest this person. And now at the same time, the president is directed uh, by law to file a, 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 a case in the International Court of Justice against the country. I mean, because it deals with countries and not individuals. And, and, and then so that the nature of the arrest warrant is to compel that individual to then appear at the World Court of Justice to defend his or her government. So then again, now you say, what is practical? What can be done practically about this if this person is in the Kremlin surrounded by you know, 30,000 nuclear weapons and, and, a, and, a, and, a, and an army equipped with all sorts of modern weaponry? Uh, how are you gonna get to that person? Well, again, this is a policy approach. And, and by doing this, you, you begin to use every technological tool we have in our, in our quiver to uh, our tool bag, I should say, to, to, uh, to begin to communicate this to the people of Russia. Let's, let's move up to Putin at this point and say, wait a second, this guy has suddenly, he's, he is now a true danger. No, no question about it. He represents a true danger to freedom, not, not only freedom, you know, to, he's not only threatening us, but he is also threatening, uh, he's obviously invaded another country. And now granted, we can't do anything necessarily in the United Nations because Russia has veto at the Security Council. Right. Can't do much in China because China has a veto. And, 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 and so well, let's, let's go back and, and just play this out. And so it, let it play out over a year. It doesn't have to be done instantly or immediately, but it has incredible communication advantages. I could say propaganda advantages because you're you're just constantly bombarded or or, 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 or or you know communicating through every means we have. We could probably send an email to every person in Russia. I mean, we could probably do that. You know, in a way, you know, we you know they they. Uh, 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 that's what uh, Russia has uh, has uh, uh, has said that they are going to do to Europe. They they are going to send a uh, an email to every address in 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 Europe, and 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 in that email they're going to list the the facility that is near them that 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 is endangering Russia and saying you know if we take out this facility you may get hurt. Well, we can do this. You know, we don't have to say that we're going to do that to Russia. I'm not saying we're going to say we're going to bomb them in that way. It's just quite the opposite. We just keep we just keep saying, you know, are you aware, you know, that Putin has, has really through, you know, he has he has just taken billions and billions and billions of dollars and we can prove this. I mean, he's one of the wealthiest people in the world today because he sucked that money out of you. You rush poor Russian people. You know this man has done this to you, and this is our case. And we we they, there's people in Russia can no longer do that, or else they get they they get a a, a cocktail of, of radioactive material to drink, and 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 they 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 kill them. Um, but but we we could do that. So it's it's a way of dealing with it. We we just simply renounce. Uh, the use of war. Now, okay, what are we going to do if suddenly we get, you know, here comes, you know, 100 ICBMs coming from Russia? Well, then that's a different case, I suppose. You know, I, I you know, I, I, Lord knows. I mean, what are we going to do? That's it. We we send ours back and that's it for humanity, pretty much. But, but uh, short of that, 
I, th I think that it's a way of, 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 of looking at the world we live in today. If we truly are as united as we are, all of humanity, all over the earth, we're, 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 we have, we've been brought together that, that we could make something like this uh, uh, be more successful than, than threatening war. Well, I, you know, yeah, I mean, listen, that's part of the reason why we haven't done some of the stuff we probably should have done from a negotiating perspective, because we just didn't want to go to war over it. But the reality is that aside from just not going to war or renouncing war, um, I think that, you know, I, th I still think there's a number of practical issues with that approach. Oh. I mean, in the sense, in the sense that, in the sense that I think it, it still feels like we are the one, like we're, I think part of, part of, part of what's in the Russian mindset and part of what's in the Russian psyche is that the U S thinks that it can do what it wants. And the U S thinks that it is, you know, above everyone else. And the, you, you know, and, that approach, I mean, it it would need to be more multilateral in a way, in order for it to have legitimacy. Right. Because because that's the thing. I mean, people, you know, it would be taken as, well, the U.S. thinks that it can declare who's a despot and who deserves to be arrested or whatever. And I know you say the International Court of Justice, but the thing is, we also haven't signed on to the International Criminal Court ourselves. I know that. And we haven't. And, I know and that. so. So I just, I'm just saying, like, I think it would have to be, there's a number of things around it that in order for it to be legitimate and to be seen as a legitimate action, um, there would need to be a number of things that don't make it so U.S. centric. I, um, I agree. And when you build, and see, this is the thing about the international system, because once you start talking about making things less less centric on one decision maker or smaller group of decision makers or wider group of decision makers, then this is how you end up with the UN Security Council because the big countries aren't going to sign on to be on the UN Security Council, including us, unless we have veto power. That's the only way you can get them to participate in the process. So there's like this continuum of sort of more of an authoritarian approach to all the way over here to a consensus-based approach. And somewhere along that continuum, you're trying to you're trying to find where to get somewhere so you can actually have enough legitimacy, but also have enough impact to actually change anything. And that's a really hard place. It's a really hard spot to find, you know? I mean, so let me give you an example, something I wanted to bring up, which was that ultimately, I don't always think it's about legit. I, Legitimacy is a piece of what you're talking about in terms of having that, like that, that work. But also it's a matter of will because, because when, way back when Russia took Crimea and when they started the entire thing in the East and all the Ukrainians said was, just protect us, give us a no flyover zone and we'll do the rest. We don't need, we don't need anything just protect us. What is that? A no-fly zone. Enforce a no-fly zone and we'll do the rest. We don't want anything else from you. But if you don't, you know, and and the interesting thing was we had every legal basis to do that because bringing up the, the this is the, this is the irony of the whole damn thing, bringing up, you know, nuclear weapons. Back at the beginning of the 90s, when the Ukraine, when Ukraine, Ukraine had a bunch, exactly, Ukraine had, had, had a bunch most of, of them nuclear had weapons from the so the Soviets had put a bunch of nuclear weapons on U in Ukrainian territory, and as a condition, as a Budapest Memorandum, a condition of giving of Ukraine giving them up and giving them to Russia was that they had security guarantees. Right. From whom? Russia, the U.S., and Europe. Right. They had security guarantees that if if they were ever invaded because they'd given up their their weapons that were on their their territory because they'd given them up. They had protection guarantees from us. And we could have absolutely 
when the whole crap started in 2014, because that's when this started, by the way, not 2022, it was 2014 when this started, we should have enforced a no-fly zone then because we had every reason to do so based on an agreement that not only we signed, but that Russia also signed. Right, right. And we didn't do it. And why didn't we do it? We didn't do it because, you know, we don't want to get involved with the war with Russia. You know, a no-fly zone, enforcing that. Well, what if we shoot down a Russian pilot and they start to do things? And they, so it all became about us not willing right. to be engaged in war. So this is what I'm saying. Like, we, we're having our bluff called because we really, you know, if we, I, I'm not a, I'm not a hawk and a proponent of war, but when you're dealing with <clears> people <throat> like Putin, if you're sh gonna shy away from it, he's gonna keep going. Right. And that's, that's the issue that I think we're seeing now. So I, you know, I say all that because it's not because I don't think that the earth can never work, but I think it's got some, some fundamental practical issues plus saying that we renounce war across the board does signal something to folks right. about so not very well-minded you know well-intentioned folks about what they think they can get away with right I, I I entirely agree with you and 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 I was just reading about this what you were just talking about just the other day the Budapest memorandum yeah yeah, yeah. from and, 1990 and I, I think it's 94 they signed it yeah. and you know you the Ukraine could have kept those weapons. I mean, they were a and the only reason nation. they gave them up is because we had security guarantees. And then we and then we're saying, oh, we can't do it in no fly. All they wanted was a no fly zone. That's yeah. all they asked for. In fact, that's all they asked for in 2022. Just give us a no fly zone. Imagine if Russia couldn't bomb them. Right. It had to be a land war, a land thing. Ukraine, they wouldn't be able to get it. I mean, it's because of the bombing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's just, you saw what happened when, when Russia tried to just invade them. It failed. It failed. They, they couldn't. They, no, you know why? Because they they sold all their gasoline on the black market. <laughs> their 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 vehicles ran out of gas in in the invasion because they're 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 so incredibly corrupt. You know, um, it, it's so I I uh, it just you know it's it seems to me that that okay, you know when I talk about you know, this, the idea that we, we would make a, this policy concept that we would never make war against the people again. Don't take me as being naive. Oh, I know. You know, I've, got I know many, I've, got, I've got too many scars on this face. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I've taken too many licks on this face. You know, I, I have fought for my life on a number of occasions. You know, I believe I, it. you're a scrappy I, type. You're I, scrappy. I, I, well, I don't. I don't want to fight. I hate to fight, and I don't like to fight. But if but you, you can't be afraid of fighting. But you can't be afraid of fighting. Cannot be afraid of fighting, and no, that no, is where the no, Russians are ahead of us. There, there's, you know, there's a, you know, there's a. The Texas Rangers have a, have a few mottos, and one of them is to defend the ground you stand on. You know, you know, you don't retreat. You know, you 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 got to stand there and 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 stand up. You know, and 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 fight and fight. Sometimes you got to fight. I remember when I was a young policeman, and and I was 21 years old, and I, and I was trained by this guy who had been who had been a professional boxer, a quite you know semi-professional boxer, uh, a great big guy, about six foot four, great big huge guy, and and we would drive around, and 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 he, he was driving around, and you know it's like this, and he says now he says son, he says. You know, you 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 know you you can't just ever quit in a fight. He said, "You're a policeman. You can't just say uncle and walk away. You've got to keep fighting." You know, and you know, but he, he. I remember one of the things he told me. He says, "If you ever really get in a bad situation, don't ever be afraid to call for help. You know, call for backup." Yeah, of course. He says, and then just start running around and around the police car. And just try to stay ahead of them until just about the time where help arrives, you start yelling, halt, halt. But 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 in any case, you know, that that is that is true. I mean, you, you know, I, I have been in, in a number of occasions where I've had to fight and 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 I and I fight and I and I and, and when I do, I go into full fury. I mean, that's my training is, is mm -hmm. you don't just dance around. 
you know, a jab, you, you go into full fury with every, everything you've got. Yeah. And, and that would be the same way that I would respond to the kinds of situations we're talking about. At the same time, you're trying to reassure the people there that we have no, you know, we, you know, we, we feel sorry for you, but, you know, this idiot, you know, is making trouble for you and making trouble for us. And, and so this is how we're going to handle it. Now, if, if he, but if something starts, well, you don't want to be close to him because it could get really hot and heavy. I got to tell you, I mean, I, I, there's part of me that, is really on board with what you're saying too, because it's like when I, the times that I visited Russia and when you can have like private conversations with people, they're like, it's a freaking junta that runs this place. You know, the junta, you know, they're not gonna, but they're not stupid enough to go on the street and do a protest with Navalny because they know they're just gonna get their head kicked in. Right. You know, so I mean like, but I, you know, and the whole, so I'm not saying that, I do think there are people in Russia who actually are supportive of, some of the uh, actions taken. I mean, it's not that they're snowed over. They, they 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 think that that Russia should be stronger and that we should be, you know, take back Ukraine or whatever. But um, but I do I do think there's a number of people who who are not who would be like, oh, good. I'm glad somebody's doing something about him because, you know, I mean, so it's it's it it you know I think let me just say this. I think with countries like. Iraq, like North Korea, like like maybe some country in Africa with the despot, you know, like, you know, it's probably more feasible to yeah. do this than it would be with a superpower country that has it's a nuclear weapon. UN. And it's, it's just much, it's a much different reality. I mean, so I'm not saying, my, my feeling would be that what you're proposing could be something that's realistic in certain cases, well, in certain cases. But but yeah. but I think that you know you know there there you 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 know this better than I because you're the you're the Russian expert but but there, there's good reason why you you say that perhaps a majority of the Russian people would still vote I don't know about a majority oh yeah oh. yeah majority would still support him. Well, yeah. a majority fifty one percent would would still vote for him for for a number of reasons one of which is they have good reason to fear us. I mean, we flew over them. I mean, look at the, you know, we, 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 we you know, we constantly, you know, with first the U2 and then the, the, the other, uh, you know, we, 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 we uh, surrounded them with nuclear weapons, whether they were, you know, they were in Turkey or in, 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 uh -huh. in Germany or in whatever we've, we've surrounded them with nuclear weapons. Uh, they, they certainly uh, have been invaded more than once in, in, in their lifetimes. I mean, over and over and over again. They, and each invaded. time have fought it off and fought it off hard. So it tells you something about what they're like when you do engage with them. Oh right? yeah. Well yeah. yeah, they 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 will defend their motherland. You know, they they're 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 uh so I I have a, tr a tremendous respect, you know, for the for the Russian people. Uh, I, I went through my period of reading Russian literature. <laughs> you know, I, we I, all have. <laughs> but it's just boy, something to it. But, but you can really get into it, you know? You can just, I mean, you really feel like you're you're climbing like Mount Everest sometimes when you read it, but it's just like you're, you're you know, you're, you're, you're part of, you're reading something epic, you yes. know, like it's, it's, it's an epic experience, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, the, you know, they have so many words, <laughs> you know, they, they, you know, that's, you know that they it is so descriptive. You know that, descriptive. that well, that's also nineteenth century literature, right? I mean, like well, that's, that's true too. Generally, but, but yeah, I agree. I agree with you. I mean, I think another thing we need to also, I think, what you just said though, I think was an important point is that we need to take some responsibility for the kind of back and forth we've had with Russia and Ukraine is very much a victim of of that. I mean, so. Bottom line is when Russia fell apart in the early 90s, you know, we didn't really help them as much as we probably could have. And they had a really dark, bad period in the 90s, you know, economically, you know, um, the mafia took over a lot of stuff because when they fell apart, the mafia was the only one who had any money um, and became the oligarchs and this whole sort of thing that happened. So, you know, when Putin first came in in 2000, a lot of people, he brought some order and that was actually welcome. 
Yeah. You know, and even I, like the first few years, several years he was in, like I thought that he was good for Russia, actually, at that period period of time, because he actually things had been in such chaos and run by the black, you know, market and mafia. And it was so bloody in some ways. I mean, it felt like he was imposing some control. People did like that. And it wasn't I didn't think it was all terrible until it got, you know, around 2010 or so. It started to kind of like get become he started to solidify consolidate power and it became something else. So, or it moved into something it was naturally moving toward. It became more of that thing. Um, but I think we need to take responsibility for the fact, again, with these international agreements we were talking about and sticking to our word, I mean, we just kept on expanding NATO. I mean, if you're Russia and you have a security organization on your borders that you're not allowed to be part of, that keeps on expanding, what the hell do you think? I mean, like, if you were to take an analogy of that, if Russia had a, uh, if Russia started a security organization that included Mexico and Canada, how would we feel about that? That we're not allowed to be part of? It's and really we, the and, analogy and again, is not crazy. And again, we also promised Russia that we wouldn't do that, and we promised that we wouldn't, and we kept on doing it. Right. So and so and so that when you look at the last expansion of NATO which was like 2004, I think, was it like the 10 countries came in? It was like a lot. Or maybe I'm thinking of European Union. But anyway, they kind of mirror each other. Long story short is the Russians were like, well, screw this. And you see this, this parallel in how Putin's policy started to become more authoritarian right. after that happened. So it's not by accident. And I'm saying we also need to take some responsibility for where things are. It's not about, oh, they're just so evil and terrible. Um, it's more about you know, there, there, there's a number of things going on. Is he a horrible, like, you know, despot? Yes. He's been killing people. He's got this palace that Navalny exposed, you know, down in the Black Sea. And he's corrupt as hell. All that's true. And what's also true is that there's a global situation that we actually contributed toward creating this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there, you know, there are no easy answers for any of these no. things, and and <laughs> and part of that, part of it is in, in response to that reality that there are no easy answers for these very difficult, complex things, is why we have to be able to discuss them openly. We right. have to be honest about them, and and we have to l learn the lessons that that are there. And, and take responsibility for our own actions in the past. We have to be able to say, no, we made mistakes and, and we should not have done this. Absolutely. And, and, we, you know, and we apologize for that. But at the same time, you don't get to do that. And But at the same time, we need to give Ukraine aid, like yeah. now, you know, because they're not gonna be able to hold out that much longer. And I don't really know what's going to happen. You know, and it's like just it's purely a product of our domestic politics that they're not getting aid. That's the only that's the only there's no other reason. It's not that people like fundamentally really have a, a reason to believe that they should. It's because they're using it as a bargaining chip on something else. Mm -hmm. And and this again, it, this is the thing that I think is about the domestic politics piece, just to circle back where we started. I mean, like that sense of responsibility for you know, how things are playing out in our own domestic politics, how much it has an impact on people in other countries. Even, I'm not saying that we're not impacted by decisions in other countries, but our decisions internally really impact people in other countries. Yeah. Um, and that's that's where I, you know, I really like, and I, I think we don't have time to get into it, but Israel and Gaza are perfect, another example of that too. I mean, it could be, a, you know, but I mean, but basically that's that's where I, I sit with it. And I I wish that we were less self-focused and a little bit more internationally focused so we could see that about our own politics and 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 put pressure on our elected officials so that they behave responsibly when it comes to these sorts of decisions. Well, we 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 need to have an educated understanding of all of these things. We, mm -hmm. we, we need to understand the history. We need to understand the, 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 the reality of the societies, the, the, the societal makeup of people. 
and and we have to uh, be prepared to compromise in a way to 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 enter into uh, agreements and then stand by those agreements and and and, and to, to because we we have to have a rule of law an enforceable rule of law otherwise it's all going to collapse it, it, you know this this world economy we have uh, this worldwide economy we have is is very fragile. I mean, it could it could just collapse down, and we're right back to, you know, pounding uh, you know stones together if if we're not careful. I mean, it could it could go down really quickly. Um, so uh, I don't know what you and I can do about it, Joanne, but uh, we can we can uh, we we can do our best to. Uh, uh, to 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 be open about it and discuss it. Yeah, no, I think so too. And I think I don't think all is lost. I'm not a doomsdayer. I'm really not, even though, you know, sometimes the doomsdaying thing, you know, you can get you down. But I, I'm not a doomsdayer. I do believe that there's possibilities and I do believe I do believe that there's examples of some politicians and people in power trying, really trying. And we need to look for that and we need to support it. And we need to not take the easy route of just saying, oh, it's all, uh, I'm just not going to pay attention. You know, we need to like take take some responsibility ourselves and pay attention and participate. Yeah, um, they, you know, they, the English, uh, I know we're, we, we're probably about out of time here, The, uh, the but the English uh, have, uh, under their system, developed white papers. Uh, yeah. Their, their policy white papers. And 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 that was one of the reasons why they were such a successful empire in a way that they they operated this this worldwide empire because they would they would study you know issues mm -hmm. and and if the same at, at, and while you may have the ruling party in parliament you know uh, that would be able to seat the prime minister and 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 and, and the cabinet. You also had a shadow cabinet that existed at the same time in all of those same areas that was studying all of the same problems, and 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 they could collectively come together and come up with white papers that would then be uh, uh, allow them to have more predictability in, in the future, and mm. and that's something that we could do. Um, you know the uh, you know I've I've long said that we we need to have you know the State Department in a way should be doing some of this you know that mm. would be a role of the State Department but I I do believe though that that we need to have and we need to have a bit of a change in our government and, and that is that it doesn't require a constitutional amendment to do this but that in addition to having a vice president we need to have two assistant presidents. One hmm. for foreign affairs, one for domestic affairs. So that 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 this burden, this gigantic burden on our president, could be lightened with some delegation. And, but do you, sh and shouldn't the Secretary of State be that foreign affairs person? But you think there needs to be a separate? I, I, no, I think it would be uh, someone different. I think the the Secretary of State should op should operate the State Department and its embassies and consulates. So and, like an administrator too, uh, right? An administrator got like, yeah. of, 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 of that. But 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 who you would have is an assistant president who would be traveling all over the world. Like um, policy advisor. As, as, mm -hmm. a, as, as, as the, as the, as the uh, assistant president dealing with uh, uh, international affairs. And and the same way you would have a domestic uh, uh, vice president, I mean, a pre assistant president, dealing with with domestic affairs and traveling around the country, tending the funerals or what you know, they're, they're, the president should be able to back off and 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 provide general policy direction, and and allow a, a government to operate. And 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 with long thought out policies that even with a change of government would continue, that because they would be they would be well thought out policies. They wouldn't just be seat of the pants political decisions made based upon the latest. But you need to be electing people who 
even think in terms of policy. That's true. That's true. Uh, that's why we need to have what George Washington wanted us to have, and that is a university of the United States to train people in every field relating to government. Uh, mm. That we need to have a department of transportation, the department of energy, or, or, or I'm, I'm saying a school, a school of it. You know, first the you know the school, of, you know, the university of the United States would bring in all the military academies. That would be the you know the first thing that would all come within their ambit, but then you would also have schools in all of these other areas, including diplomacy, and, and including justice, and and all of these areas to train people in policy, how to, in the concept of policy and how to make policy, and how to and 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 to and to and to. And to learn what the what the rule of law is and and the value of the rule of law and continuity and and to train these these people who could take these positions throughout government and and to give us professional uh, uh, professionals in these areas who are trained in these areas. Well, well, okay. That's, that's oh, okay, that so fascinating. Sure what... That was a good. That was a good romp through international affairs and it was. And all it, that stuff. really was. Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I I learned a lot tonight, uh, Joanne. <laughs> now, okay, I think it's almost. It was certainly time to wrap this up again. I'd like to take the opportunity to show the book, the the Voters' Bill of Rights, the Transforming America. It's available at uh, my website, WilliamJohnCox.com, or uh, uh, for a free download, or it's available at Amazon if you want the print copy at cost. Also, if you're interested in the work on consciousness, go to mindkind.info uh, for the Gift of Mind series. And again, the print books are available or free downloads of all of them. But more, mostly, please go to the vote.io. And that's the vote.io. There you can assert your rights of liberty. You can express that your consent to be governed is uh, not unconditional, and that it is uh, conditional upon us having a government that is not corrupt and ineffective, and um, that we can have uh, uh, so some control over that. And also, uh, I'd like to say that you know, we, we've been viewed uh, more than 3,000 times. Um, almost 3,500 3, times as of a little bit ago for, oh, wow. for the videos from, from uh, last week and the introduction video. So folks, uh, please, uh, if you like what we're doing here, uh, subscribe and to, to the channel to uh, give us a like, post a comment, and, uh, and also to um, share with others. Joanne? Here's, cheers to the people, all of the people, and may their consent to be governed never be taken for granted. Hallelujah. All right. Good night. Thank you, William. I got it's time time for some more wine. I'm nearly okay. empty. Good night. All right. Have a good rest of your weekend. Okay. Take care. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Goodbye. Good night, folks.